Well, hello again. It is Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding, and uh, I have a special guest with us today. It's Dr. Matt McLean from the Masters University. Uh, Dr. McLean is a professor at the Masters University where he teaches on vertebrate paleontology. And today we're going to be discussing uh, a topic that is a little bit controversial in creationist circles. Uh, we're going to be talking about feathered dinosaurs. Uh, so, uh, Dr. McLean, uh, I have, uh, I guess, a question that uh, a lot of people uh, would like to ask in creation circles, and it would be, are there such things as feathered dinosaurs? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, um, and I think you got to start with, obviously, looking at fossil evidence, right? Like, what's, what's out there? Because today, the only animals you can find who have feathers are birds, you know? So, when we look at... Um, fossils, of course, there's Archaeopteryx, which most people have heard of, but there's this debate over, you know, do you call this a dinosaur, do you call this a bird? Um, it's traditionally been considered a bird, right? Um, but starting in the 90s and moving to um, the present, um, especially in China, but in a few other countries as well, like in, um, in um, Germany and in uh, Canada, um, there have been some fossils found of animals that have been considered dinosaurs for decades now with filamentous and feathery things preserved in the fossils. So um, there's lots of excellent fossils, um, especially from China, so like Inchiornis and Microraptor, uh, which has four wings, which is pretty crazy. Um, and uh, you've got Sinornithosaurus. Um, and like I said, in North America, um, they've found uh, feathers on Ornithomimosaurs and evidence of feathers on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many times you don't find evidence of feathers on a dinosaur fossil simply because you don't have the right preservation possibilities, right? Um, you've got to have like a really exceptional preservation, what we call lager stata, to get that kind of um, feathery and little filaments and stuff preserved on the fossil. Mm -hmm. But doesn't having feathers on a dinosaur mean that dinosaurs evolved into birds? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the common jump people make, right? And, and I think it's understandable because we've been told for so long that... Um, we would expect to find dinosaurs with feathers because birds evolved from dinosaurs, right? That's, that's the conventional story. Um, and so I think it was right for creationists to respond to that because we know that God made birds on day five and land animals on day six, right? So um, people are automatically against that. But um, unfortunately, we kind of put the cart before the horse, you know, and we need to go out there and actually look at what, what is in the rocks. What do we actually see? right? Um, instead of coming with those presuppositions. And so when we look at it, we do see animals that are not like birds today. They are things we traditionally call dinosaurs and they've got feathers on them. So you could say, you could come at it from an evolutionary presupposition and say, yeah, this is what I'd expect to see a dinosaur evolving in a bird. What if you come at it from a creationist perspective? Well, um, when you're doing that, you're going to say, okay, first of all, there are a lot more animals that had feathers than I previously knew. Right, so we think of this small circle of animal state, which actually it's a lot of species, but still it's a small group of living animals that have feathers and we call them birds. Mm -hmm. And so we automatically assume the past is like the present, okay? But when you look at the past, there's a wider circle of things that have feathers, right? Of which ours is a subset. There's other types of birds that are extinct, and then there's even animals that are not birds that have feathers on them. Um, and so, you know, what you could say then is, yeah, there are other animals that have feathers other than just birds. Mm -hmm. And I think it's helpful to think in terms of a nested hierarchy when you think of like Russian nesting dolls, you know, um, that there'd be a big group of animals with feathers. Um, and then you open that one up, take out the smaller one. That's all your avialins, which are all the fossil living birds you take out there. Then you've got your modern birds inside of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just a helpful way to think of it. Um, and so what, what's exciting to me about this whole topic of feathered dinosaurs is that you're seeing that God's um, handiwork is being put on display and that the um, design he built into creation is more complicated than what we previously thought. Well, that's fantastic. That's exactly what we'd expect to see from a biblical mm -hmm. you know, creationist perspective. What about, I mean, it says clearly in the text, though, that birds were made on day five. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I mean that's that's why creationists have held to this position of birds could not have evolved from land-dwelling animals, right? Which I think we're right about that because the text is very clear. Um, so then you got the question of what does the Bible mean when it says a bird, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you read Leviticus and it lists the birds you should not eat, 
right? And one of them is a bat. And I still think that's right. You probably shouldn't eat a bat. But um, you've got bats there, right? And no person from a scientific background is going to say a bat is a bird, right? I mean, it's nonsense. They, they don't have feathers. I mean, they clearly have fur. They're clearly mammals, right? They have mammary glands and they give birds to live young and all this kind of mammalian traits. Um, and so we don't think of that as a bird. And so some people try to jump on that and be like, see, the Bible's wrong. Like it says that bats are birds. Well, no. What they mean by bird is a flying animal, right? I mean, that's, that's a very typical way of thinking about it. Until you actually go into the gross anatomy, you're not going to really distinguish between a bat and a bird. And in fact, there's many societies today around the world that have different kind of um, what we call folk taxonomies, that their own culture, the way they organize and classify animals, and some of them will put bats with birds, and some of them will separate them out, you know? And so it just depends. Um, and so when we think about what was actually made on day five, I think obviously things we call birds, bats, pterosaurs, like pterodactyls, those would have been flying animals. Um, probably your winged insects would have been fitting in there. And then um, I think, you know, a lot of these animals that we have been calling dinosaurs that have feathers, some of them may have been originally flying and have lost the ability to fly in the pre flood world. Um, and if that's the case, they also would have made on that day. And then people are like, oh, wait, hold on. You can't have some dinosaurs made on one day and some made on the other. That's not fair. And it's like, of course it's fair. We have bats, right? Bats were made on day five. The rest mm -hmm. of the mammals are made on day six. That's not a problem. Part of this issue I find in creationism is that people think a dinosaur is a type of animal like a dog or a cat. And they don't realize that there's tons and tons of different kinds of dinosaurs. Like this is a very large group of animals. Mm -hmm. So when I say dinosaur, like I said, it's not like saying dog. Um, it's more like saying you know, mammal, or maybe a subset of mammals, placental mammals, or something like that. It's a big group of, of animals. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there's no problem with God making some of them on one day and some of them on the other day. Okay. What about the fossil record? Um, you know, uh, many will come and say, but we see the fossils of uh, dinosaurs, like theropod dinosaurs, turning into uh, sort of uh, primitive uh, bird-like creatures, which then evolve into more advanced or derived kind of uh, birds, right? What, what would what would we think of that as creationists? Yeah, I mean that's that's the next question, right? Um, so you know, um, one of the things I did with um, some other researchers is we did some baromenology work, you know, the study of created kinds, and we found that there there are discontinuities, right? There's there's really are um, separations between different groups. It's not just this nice continuous spectrum from a dinosaur into a bird. You can it's punctuated by discontinuity. But at the same time, I can't arrange them, right? And I've got nested hierarchy, and then we've got the fossil record and stratigraphy. And so that needs to be thought through. It's not enough just to say, hey, they're different kinds, boom, my work is done, right? So um, when you're thinking about the fossil record, what you have to remember is that most of the people who are doing this work, they're already committed to this idea that birds came from somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Birds are evolving from some other kind of animal. Dinosaurs make sense, and they think they're evolving from that. And so um, they're already coming at it with that lens of seeing a dinosaur evolving into a bird over time, right? Um, so we've got to come at it, obviously, with our different lens and look at what are the patterns, okay? So if you look in the Mesozoic, if you look at Triassic and Jurassic rocks, you're finding dinosaurs, right? You can find theropods in there. Um, but you find your first clear evidence of feathers and really bird-like things with Archaeopteryx and Anchiornis and Jautinia, those other animals that are uppermost Jurassic rocks. So let's jump now into the Lower Cretaceous, right? Um, there's tons of different kinds of things. You can find birds with short bony tails, pygostyles, um, and no teeth. You can find some that still have the long bony tail like an Archaeopteryx. You can find other dinosaurs with feathers, dromaeosaurids and oviraptorosaurs and all kinds of things. And then there's toothed birds with short tails. And there's, there's like tons of different types. Some can fly, some cannot fly, some can glide. And it's just an explosion of different types, right? And when we did baromenology work, we're looking at, these are several created kinds here. Um, and then, once you hit the Cenozoic, you lose a lot of these unusual Mesozoic bird groups, and suddenly you're just left with our modern bird, you know, forms. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, you could interpret, the, interpret that as an evolutionary sequence. But you could also look at it and say, well, it looks like you've got different communities that are being preserved, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not seeing a clear transition from what's going on in the Jurassic into the Cretaceous ones with nice, you know, um, branching here and there. Like you'd imagine, like, the horse series in the Cenozoic, where you can find like, this nice sequence of, of mm -hmm. evolution. Um, so it looks like it's a punctuated kind of thing, um, where maybe the flood is burying this kind of environment and then it buries this kind of environment where these animals live together. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're getting to the Cenozoic, 
there's a very clear pattern that goes together with birds and mammals, right? Where the birds and mammals that live with dinosaurs die with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a few exceptions to that, but in general, that seems to be the rule. And so my suspicion is that the pre-flood world where humans lived, we probably lived with mammals and birds much more like the ones today. Um, and that place has either been completely destroyed or we just haven't found it yet, right? We found evidence of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas most of the world was probably dominated by dinosaur-like communities, other kinds of reptilian communities. And there'd be birds and mammals that lived with those and then died with those and didn't recover after the flood, is my so, guess. So you think then there was some kind of discontinuity with animal communities before the flood? I mean, that's my guess. Like, when you look at it, if, if the flood really is... Rep or if, you know... For instance, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, if those strata are flood deposits, right. then there really need to be separate kinds of communities where you're not getting mixing happening during the flood, right? right? Um, and, you know, the kind of stuff you find in the Upper Triassic is very different from the kind of stuff you find in the Upper Cretaceous, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so you could explain that as an evolutionist or even an old earth creationist would do with, you know, faunal succession or replacements. Right. Um, but if it was all in the world at the same time, you need to think of some other explanation. And so my guess is that there were pretty separate communities. Mm -hmm. And so we look at our world today and we're like, well, that's nonsense. Things just mix all over the place. Well, we live in a post-disaster world, right? Mm -hmm. That's like saying you had a nice, you know, organized city block gets, you know, demolished by some kind of natural disaster and then people come and recolonize it. Well, it's going to be a mess afterwards, you know? Mm -hmm. And you look at it and you say, oh, it was never neat and tidy. Well, maybe it was before, before the disaster, you know? And so I think that um, we have this temptation to always want to use the present to interpret the past, mm -hmm. even when we're creationists. Mm -hmm. And there can be a lot of danger in that. Um, mm -hmm. It's helpful. It's a good analogy, but it's not our only tool. Right. Good. Well, that's been very helpful. I know uh, as an early creationist, uh, back in the sort of late 90s, uh, a lot of these feathered dinosaurs were coming onto the scene. And uh, the creationist community at the time was very, very against yeah. the idea of feathers on dinosaurs. And I remember thinking even back at that time, why? I mean, why would that be such a bad thing? But because the community was so against that, uh, there was, I felt, a dissonance uh, as a creationist. So yeah. uh, this has been very, very helpful. Um, I just want to thank Dr. McLean for being on the program today. And we will see you all uh, next time on Creation Unfolding. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.